All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get started. A little, a little cramped in here to start things out with, um, but welcome to planning a night sky viewing at your library. This is a uh, another StarNet webinar, and we're excited to be with you all today. Um, we're just going to do a quick little Zoom orientation, and because if you can't figure out Zoom right now, you probably can't hear me, so I'll go ahead and go to this next slide. And I'll just leave that there for just one second, so you can go through that. You can uh, type in that Google Help link. Um, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of customization you can do, um, but the big things are to make sure to click on the chat icon at the very bottom of the toolbar. And I'm going to do that right now just to make sure no one's saying, hey, we can't hear you. All right, great. If somebody would just say yes, or we can hear you in the chat box, that would be great. Yes, okay, great, thank you, Anna. Um, so a quick little uh, housekeeping note, when you chat in the chat box, you'll see uh, there's a two, and you can put the um, either all panelists or all panelists and attendees. Please make sure to select all panelists and attendees. The first time you do it, and let me go ahead and do it myself. Uh, the first time you select all panelists and attendees, um, it will stay like that, but that's so everybody can see your message um, and everybody can see that feedback. So we'll be getting a lot of feedback from everybody. We'll be talking a lot today in the chat box and uh, hopefully have enough time for a QA. and a um, So just make sure everybody sees that. And we'll say that like 20 more times, so you know. <laughs> All right. Hello, Christina. Oh, wonderful. Okay, so here's the agenda for today. It is jam-packed. Um, you know, Kellyanne, we usually do like webinars with very cheap materials, but I think this might be the most accessible easy to procure materials list that we've ever had. Most yeah. of our activities today are gonna to be um, like printables, really easy, um, low low cost, and things that you can do uh, in conjunction with a night sky viewing, or maybe when, if you have a you know cloudy night and you can't get out there and look at the stars, things you could do in lieu of a night sky viewing. So we'll be touching on a lot of these activities today. Um, we'll be talking again about what a night sky viewing is, ways that you can bring partners into your library to help you facilitate that. Uh, and of course, if we have time, we'll do a Q&A regardless, but I hope you have time to stick around for the Q&A. Greg, if you wouldn't mind putting the link bank in the chat box. Um, so we have a link bank that's going to be a really good handy resource. You can't really click into the slides to get those links. Um, thanks. Thanks, Greg. That was quick. Uh, you can't really click into the slide to get those links during the Zoom presentation. So if you'll reference that link bank, and then that's a lot of really good resources that will just you know carry you through all of summer reading. Um, and doing STEM in libraries. So we would uh, really recommend checking out all those links uh, in addition to today's webinar. Let's see, we got a question already. Oh, you don't need to sign in, Carolyn. Thank you there. You sign in, you've already signed in, so you're good to go. Welcome. Yes. <laughs> all right, so I have some very exciting news. You guys are probably used to seeing me and Kellyan um, on, on these StarNet webinars. We do have a pretty big numbers today, so I'm not, uh, Maybe you haven't seen us before, but we have two new staff members. You may have met Stephanie during the last webinar. Did you come on the screen or were you just? I was just there virtually, but I've been on some other stuff just around StarNet. Yeah. So Stephanie, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself when you when you joined? And Yeah. So my name is Stephanie Vero Fields. Um, I've been here since about the middle of November. So right around Thanksgiving time of last year. Uh, I come here after working for Boy Scouts of America, Walt Disney World. Um, I got my master's degree over in England, so I've kind of been well-traveled, uh, all kind of based on archaeology and science and STEM and all that. So I'm here as an education coordinator to kind of help build those relationships with you guys and give you resources and whatever help you need. Yeah, awesome. So if you're thinking like, man, this webinar is great, but we could really use this resource or we could really, uh, where can we find this or where can we connect in with the StarNet community? Stephanie would be a great person to talk to and she'll be monitoring the chat box today to, to kind of help us, uh, get all your questions answered. I'll make sure to throw my email in there. Good call. And <laughs> on her second day on the job, <laughs> we are, you know, feeding her to the wolves. Um, Claire Ratcliffe just joined our team. Claire, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Claire Ratcliffe. Like he said, uh, today's my second day working for the Space Science Institute, and I'm thrilled to be here. Um, I got my master's degree in science education from the University of Wyoming, so just up the road from where we are now. Um, yeah, I have a background in STEM education. Uh, I've worked in informal education with the Big, Bro Big Brothers Big Sisters Boys and Girls Club, as well as it, formal education at a K through eight uh, public school. So I am thrilled to be joining the team. I will be helping out as 
an education coordinator doing a lot of the professional development stuff. So helping out with these webinars, doing workshops and things like that. So I'm excited to be here. Yeah. yeah. So you'll, you'll see Claire a lot. Um, you might not see Stephanie because she'll be behind the scenes, but um, yeah, these are the, the newest members of our team and we are so glad that they have joined us to help us bring awesome professional development and STEM training to you all, the greatest audience in the world. And then don't forget Greg. Oh, yes, sorry, I have him on there. Greg, uh, if you'd like to introduce yourself in the chat box, he's been on pretty much every webinar that we've had, um, putting links in the chat box, but I feel like he never gets a, a shout out. So um, shout out to Greg. Greg, thank you, Greg. <laughs> and so let's see. Oh, I did say, um, I'm, I was gonna throw a little curveball at you all. Before you go, name one of your, okay, name your favorite thing in our solar system. Saturn. Oh, that was definitive, okay. <laughs> Um, well, my favorite planet is Venus, mm -hmm. so I'll go with Venus. Venus, Saturn, okay, yeah, nice. that's strong. Mine was Enceladus because I had a lot of time to look this up and do some <laughs> yeah. research beforehand. I was gonna say, I love Cassini, so that's why I love Saturn. Yeah, nice. very nice. nice. All right, so I'll just kind of do a really quick resource overview. All this information is in your link bank, so we don't want to take up your time just talking at you and telling you all these cool resources. Um, but the reason, or one of the main reasons we're doing these webinars uh, is because the Universe of Stories summer reading theme. I'm sure you all are here because of that, um, not just because you like us so much. Um, uh, so we're, gonna, we're partnering with the Collaborative Summer Library Program to try and support every library in the country in helping them with their summer reading theme. Um, this is done through our website, starnetlibraries.org. And I shouldn't say just our website, um, our community, our library, STEM and library community, Starnet Libraries. There's a ton of, of professional development resources on Starnet. Um, so I would say go ahead and start looking and, and uh, start navigating around. Um, there are some other helpful webinars that we've done in the past and archived and recorded. So like Starnet 101 would be a webinar and that would be really helpful to help you find um, your way around. So look for that in the webinar archives. It is on your link bank. Just a real quick, if you want to take a screenshot of this picture, you are more than welcome to. That's just a nice little synopsis of the, some of the biggest resources or some of the most, <clears throat> excuse me, applicable resources that we offer. I'll give you five seconds to take a screenshot of that. And again, all those links are in your link bank. And our STEM activity clearinghouse is where we host about 185 to 200, the number's always increasing. STEM activities that are specifically designed for the library setting. Um, so accessible, um, not really strictly tied to any uh, uh, standards, if you will. Um, they are oftentimes cheap, um, affordable, easy to facilitate. Some are low mess, some are high mess. I thought the librarians didn't like messes, but I have been proven wrong. Um, so Where's check the it. Fun in that? Yeah, I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I, I had a lot of misconceptions about libraries before I started working working with you all. And lastly, I just want to throw up our Summer of Space page um, up here. If you go to our events page and then scroll down to Summer of Space, you can register to sign up and you'll get like, uh, you know, first, first release of new resources and information and new activities and things like that. You can also register your library um, and get uh, entered into a chance to win one of two free Orion Star Blast, tele Star Blast telescopes. So some cool opportunities there. Um, you can see other libraries that are doing Summer of Space programming as well. Okay, so we have a poll question, and we just thought, and 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 uh, with President Day, you know, just just happening, it would be a fun question to ask: What U.S. president started NASA? So let me open up the polls real quick, and I put a lot of options here. Which U.S. president started NASA? Okay, so we're in progress. We have about twenty guesses so far. Do you guys have an idea? I don't answer. I mean, just get it. Uh -huh. get oh, it going. okay. <laughs> yeah. Let me check the chat box real quick. I'm down to three. And we'll give you a few more seconds. Greg, if you want to drop the link bank in one more time, just for anybody that joined us um, in the past minute or so. Okay, 75% have voted. Uh, what's your guess? Um, I'm actually going with Ford. Ford? Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Oh, I'm going to go with George Washington. George Washington. <laughs> wow. 
question, man, question ahead of time. did you get enough sleep last night uh i know the answer it was dwight eisenhower so let me share those results uh, i think jfk probably gets a lot of the credit because he really um took the space program right and, and pushed it and advocated for it um, but dwight eisenhower actually started nasa as a government entity um and i believe it started out as with different acronyms and different words involved and then it kind of evolved into what it is today so a little fun tidbit for you all right so we're going to jump into our first activity claire stephanie thank you for coming on screen if you would now go we'll be off right screen on the chat box <laughs> NACA, that's right, exactly. All right. Nice, I love the history. I know. So we uh, today are talking a lot about, and I want to scoot over. Yeah, that you sounds good. <laughs> We're talking a lot about doing a night sky viewing at your library. Um, and there are a few different ways that you can approach this. But in general, a night sky viewing is going to be where you have patrons at your library looking at the night sky. Uh, there is uh, there is a ton of great type like different types of programming you can do. Um, there are a ton of great partnership opportunities you can do with the night sky viewing. One thing to be uh, aware of if you plan a night sky viewing, which has happened to, uh, with Kelly and myself um, in Arizona of all places, just um, recently. Yeah, just recently, there is a chance that you can get rained out. You can get um, any cloud cover or not any cloud cover, but substantial cloud cover can really obscure your view. Mm -hmm. um, so you kind of have to have some activities in your back pocket. So you get all your patrons that at your library, they're really excited, they're so pumped up, and then some clouds come overhead. Um, you know, it could be a bummer, but if you have activities in your back pocket to at least maybe even delay like 20 or 30 minutes, you do an activity mm -hmm. uh, and then you can do the night sky viewing. Or if you have to reschedule it for another night, um, you know, it's not the end of the world, but it is good if you have all those people that have some cool activities. So we're gonna start with a pretty simple activity. It's called Big Dipper Star Clock. Um, and it's really, it's fun, it's easy. It's something that you could do even a week ahead of time of your night sky viewing mm -hmm. to kind of build some interest. Um, or it's something you could do right before your night sky viewing. There's a lot of different programming options with this. So the basic idea is that you construct a little clock, right? Um, and you use the location of the Big Dipper to find out what time it is, or vice versa, you use the time in the month to find out where the Big Dipper is. So let's say it is a cloudy night and you're like, everybody's bummed, they can't go and look at the night sky, you can still make your Big Dipper star clocks can orient it and figure out, oh, the Big Dipper would actually be right over there. Um, so pretty fun, pretty easy. Again, very cheap. This actually is the most materials intensive. I think you need one brass fastener. Um, so let me go ahead and jump over to our Elmo cam, which will give us just Good. a second to transition. All right, we'll do a quick little audio test. It looks like we're coming in. So again, this is really, really simple. That's why I can't hear it. Okay, I can see. Yeah, if, if you can't hear us, then well, if you can't hear us, just put a yes in the chat box. Uh, so really simple. It comes in a big uh, predetermined activity sheet. Um, let's see. Oh wait, you're watching it too. We just make sure. Test one, two, test one. Okay, comment. Great, thank year. you guys. Thank you. So it'll come, uh, you first step will obviously be to cut these two things out. They come on the same sheet. Um, so you just, it's one sheet per kiddo. <laughs> obviously you don't wanna do it double-sided. Um, you will put this down. You'll put the big dipper or the, this part of the star clock on top of it. And so simple, you just secure it right through there. These brass fasteners work really, really well. Of course, there are other things that you could use. Um, that would work pretty well, but these brass fasteners, it'll actually turn around and move. So the idea here is that you're gonna to wanna to paint, uh, point your star clock towards the north. Uh, now I know which way north is, but it doesn't really matter to you all. Um, so we will point, let's see, we're in February. Well, let's, let's say this direction's north. And the time is 2.15. And you know what, Brooks, I'm gonna just rotate the view for everybody because uh, yeah, the, the, um, the image is coming through flipped because of our camera view, not because it's flipped in print. That is interesting. Oh, weird. <laughs> is it mirroring? It is mirroring. Oh, let's see. Well, 
Andrea. Trust us, the handout is 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 something you can print out and use. To our eyes, it looks perfect. Yeah. Sorry, on the webinar here, we're getting a little bit of a a, a reflection for you, so it will be it will be uh, proper for you. In sure. The and I, copy. I see somebody ask if they can enlarge the screen. You can actually do that yourself. There should be a little. Um, uh, <laughs> the screen is split and you can move the, the middle bar of the screen to make one size larger, one size smaller. And then you can toggle on the upper right, the speaker view, and there's a few other options as well um, that can make you, uh, help you change the screen. Anyway, regardless, let's say we have our um, month, well, now we're changing it up. This is north. We will find out what time it is. And we will know, looking north, that the Big Dipper is actually gonna be right here, okay? So 2 p.m. 215, of course we can't see the Big Dipper right now. Let's say it's gonna be 9 p.m. tonight, we're outside. Again, February, pointing north. We would know the Big Dipper would be in this kind of like upper right quadrant right here. All right, so alternatively, I mean, we all have clocks, you know, it's pretty easy to tell the time these days. But if you were trying to do a fun kind of experiment with your kiddos or your adult patrons, and you knew where the Big Dipper was and you could see it pretty clearly, you could do that in the opposite order. So say, oh, okay, I've got my month pointed. The Big Dipper's over here, it's 10 a.m. Well, that doesn't really make sense, but yeah. So pretty easy to use. Um, one thing to note, if you do, if you are uh, in daylight savings, you need to add an hour to this. Um, so this summer, um, it, you'll probably wanna add one hour um, depending on where you are. I know Arizona doesn't do daylight savings, but I guess everybody else will probably wanna add an hour. Mm. All right, so pretty simple, easy activity. We'll head back to our studio view. All right. So that is Big Dipper Star Clock. Again, you can see how that's pretty easy to have a little, you can even have it as a station. You can make that a take home that you give kids. Um, as they are leaving a program, mm -hmm. a lot of options with that. Continue the learning on at home. Mm -hmm. That's a fun thing for a, a kid to do with their parent too, I feel like. All right, we're gonna do a, another poll question. We're gonna kind of get in the meat and potatoes of our webinar today and talk um, specifically about some of the logistics of doing a night sky viewing and different organizations that you can partner with. I know right now some of you might be thinking like, I do not know how to work a telescope. I do not know where to look in the night sky um, for a specific planet. Um, most people don't, so that's okay. You're not, you don't need to be a subject matter expert. You don't need to be um, an astronomer to host a night sky viewing. There are great, great, great groups that you can work with before. So I do wanna get a kind of an idea of y'all's level of experience. Let's see. So let me find our second poll real quick. And this question is, have you hosted a night sky viewing before? So just a good idea for us to get a, a feel of our, of our audience here. We'll give you about 10 more seconds to answer. Oh, a hurricane canceled it. That's, yeah, certainly would not be able to see much. Probably would cancel a lot of programs, right? <laughs> All right, so Janet did not see it. share our results. Janet, you need to, um, in the bottom toolbar, there's a polls button that you'll need to click into. Um, so it should be like chat, raise hand, Q&A, and polls. If it's not on your bottom, it'll be at the top of your screen. So most people have said no, which I guess is probably why you're at this webinar. Um, let's see, no, but our library has considered it. Yes, 10 people have said yes, and then four people have said yes, but it was canceled due to weather. Excellent. So we're not trying to scare you off by any means, and we'll talk about how great these volunteers that you have a chance to work with are. Um, and mm -hmm. it's it's really, uh, they're, they're very eager to come out and help you uh, with a night sky viewing. So I'm not trying to scare you off, but it's just something to think that weather does happen and you need to have backup plans. Luna has a question, does it count if I did a night sky viewing during the middle of the day when the power had gone out and it was very dark in the library? <laughs> does it count if we did a night sky viewing, the power went out and it was very dark in the library? You know, yeah, if you talked about <laughs> constellations enough, I think that counts. 
Okay, so we are going to go to our second poll question. Um, have you attended a night sky viewing? Let me go ahead and launch that. So simple yes or no, have you ever attended a night sky viewing before? In a library or on our own? Um, either. So whether at a library or on your own. Yeah. Oh, wow. I went to, oh, and so just a quick note, when you chat, please make sure that you are uh, sending your messages to all panelists okay. and attendees or else, because there's so many people in the chat box, Kelly and I can't really see them. Um, so yeah, once again, all panelists and attendees, um, because I see that somebody says they went to Bryce Canyon and saw the magic there, and that sounds awesome, but oh, you, just sent it, you just sent it to me, so not everybody else got to see that's it. That's lovely. Yeah, can't think of a better place really to go do a nice exactly. viewing. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so let me share those results. That's actually split right down the middle, um, half and uh, half. Pretty cool. Yeah, if you haven't, I would recommend, uh, that's a great way to really get a head start on doing a night sky viewing. Go find one in your local community. Definitely. Um, the winter constellations are really uh, particularly interesting, I would say, and uh, you don't have to stay up too late to go check them out. Mm -hmm. And our last one. Have you looked through a telescope before? Seems like a simple question, but. You own two, okay. Recently is very relative, Luna, you're correct. Uh, in the past five years, old enough for you to remember how amazing it was. Mm, hard to forget, I think. Yeah, right. Okay, I'll go ahead and launch these. Um, so let's see. Most have said yes a long time ago, yes recently, and then a few have not. Um, I only bring this up because if you have not looked through a telescope recently, it's looked at something as simple as the moon. It is mind blowing. I mean, I haven't, I didn't look at a telescope for like 15 years of my life until you know uh, the most recent two years when I started working here again, and it is just spectacular. So I would encourage you all um, to find a local night sky club, an astronomy club, or anybody doing a night sky viewing, or um, maybe a local planetarium or science center, and go look at the moon with a telescope or a set of binoculars. It is really, really spectacular, and it'll get give you chill bumps and get you motivated to do your own night sky viewing. Definitely. Yeah. Did you have anything you wanted to, wanted to add? No, I think we're, we've got good input here on how everybody's, what everyone's experienced. So thanks for sharing. Yeah, or if you circulate a telescope, and most of the night sky viewings I've gone to, this is from Jennifer, where meteor shower watches with no Fantastic. telescopes. Still a great opportunity great. to get folks out um, to observe the night sky. Absolutely, and there's a great uh, meteor shower that happens every uh, August. So if you wanted to do some sort of grand finale, uh, they do happen. The best time to see those meteorite, meteors though is in the wee hours of the morning, like 3 a.m. So uh, just if you're particularly brave mm -hmm. to host one of those. Awesome. So we're gonna talk about a couple of networks that you guys can utilize um, for doing these night sky viewings. The Solar System Ambassadors are a great group of uh, just volunteers from around the country um, that uh, are kind of, I don't know, affiliated with NASA or just part of their- They're, they're NASA's volunteer networks. So these are NASA volunteers that we're pointing you to. Mm -hmm. And so we've got two groups and we've got uh, some, our, our collaborators within the NASA network here to share with you, well, virtually online here recorded, uh, <laughs> to share with you the differences um, between those networks and how you must might best yeah. tap into them. I'll just let Vivian uh, <laughs> and do the explanation here. So we're going to show a video. Um, it may not be as high resolution because it's screen sharing from my computer. Uh, the video link is in the link bank. So if you're like, oh, this is choppy, this doesn't look so good, you can go to the link bank, pull up the video from there. Greg, if you'll drop the link bank in one more time. Um, and you can watch the video there, or you can table it and watch it later. Um, just a quick little overview of these two networks and the differences between them. Take just a minute. There we go. Hi, everybody. We are so thrilled that you're planning on utilizing. 
Uh oh. Sorry, guys. Let me just get it work and up, and then I'm not going to touch anything. It is working. So it's not working on mine. That's working on hers. Oh, is it working? Um, it's frozen right now. Hi, everybody. We are yeah. so thrilled that you're planning on utilizing the Night Sky Network and the Solar System Ambassadors for your library. Libraries can be such valuable learning centers for all members of your communities, and we know that you serve everyone. And we're hoping that our networks are going to help you bring space science to your community. So my name is Vivian White, and I I work at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific here in San Francisco, and today I am going to be telling you about the NASA Night Sky Network, which is an amazing program that has more than 425 astronomy clubs across the country, and you are able to use them as a resource uh, to help bring space science to your library. They do lots and lots and lots of volunteering all over their communities, and I just wanted to give you a couple of examples. I have pictures here that show some amateur astronomers at local libraries. They have, often they have telescopes. That's one of the things that amateur astronomers are known for. And they bring these telescopes out during the day and at night. You can see in the top right, there is a woman who's showing off a picture of the sun. Those are great. We have, um, there's always lots of excitement around the sun. Sometimes you can see sunspots. Um, they also bring out telescopes, whether it's rainy or clear. So in the bottom left, this man is showing some kids how telescopes work, even though it's um, uh, not such a clear night. So um, on the bottom right, you'll see a map of clubs all across the country, and there's bound to be one somewhere near you. Uh, you can click on that map on the website, or you can put in your zip code, and it will get you to the nearest um, club that has, it will show all of their upcoming activities and events that are happening. But the NASA Night Sky Network is also a lot more than just amateur astronomers. While it's created for amateur astronomers, it has a ton of other resources to share. And the outreach resources can be found right on the main page. Um, you just hit outreach resources. And these are um, informal learning activities on many, many different um, Topic. So you can sort, if you want to know something about the moon, you could sort um, by moon activities and it would give you lots of different activities as well as webinars that we've had with lunar scientists and, um, and different handouts that you might want to print or star charts that you could print. In addition to just uh, hands-on activities, we have a night sky planner on there and that will help you and your library to know what's up in the sky this month so you can plan. It also goes pretty far in advance. You can see what's up for the whole year if you want to plan events around, say, a Mercury transit or a full moon. Um, has all of those pieces in there, as well as the monthly night sky notes. I thought you might be interested in those. This is a monthly newsletter. It's a one-page um, article article that has a great picture that you can use that uh, freely it comes in a Word document as well as a PDF and you can use that. It tells you what's up in the night sky as well as what's going on with NASA missions. So those are some of the resources that I thought you might like to know about. And uh, let's see, did I get all of the things I was thinking about? I think so. There are already hundreds and hundreds of um, events at libraries every year. So if you haven't had your local amateur astronomy club come join you at your library, I encourage you to contact them. If you click on your local astronomy club when you find the closest one to you, there is a um, link that says request an event. So you can request that they come out to an event that you're already having or maybe work with them on holding a star party at your library. They also do presentations inside um, often and um, have these toolkits that we create of those hands-on outreach resources. So they have lots of materials that they can use to engage audiences of all ages. So I want to pass the mic now to Heather Doyle of the um, Solar System Ambassadors. Let's see if I can do that. Hi, Heather. Hello, everyone. Um, as Vivian said, my name is Heather Doyle and I work with the Solar System Ambassadors. Um, and the Solar System Ambassadors are actually, let me share my desktop here really quick. Um, individuals um, instead of a club. So Vivian talked about the Night Sky Network being a club of volunteers, and these are individuals who are nationwide. 
So Solar System Ambassadors, as you see on the left, are expert volunteers that um, share NASA's missions and science through events. So you can find your local ambassador through this website down here at the bottom, solarsystem.nasa.gov. There's also a map there similar to the one that Vivian had uh, where you can click on your state and you can also find the ambassador by their last name. So who are they? They are your local NASA nerds. They love science, they love NASA, and they just want to share that with everybody. So far in 2018, ambassadors ran over 400 events um, that, re that reached 16,000 people. And I say so far because ambassadors are still um, recording their events. Um, they actually submit them back to us. So there are already a lot of um, partnerships with local libraries, and I've put a few examples on this slide here. You can see an ambassador on the left in the middle um, uh, during a story time. And you can see back on the table, she has a laptop that she's also working with, or um, an iPad and a couple of books. And then Jan Hill um, here on the right said she's having her third Apollo presentation. So there are a lot of ambassadors that once they start that relationship with their local library, they end up doing a series of events and they create their own um, programs or they work with you on your needs. So I wanted to share with you how to find your local ambassador with our website. So if you go to solarsystem.nasa.gov slash ambassador, you come to this page here and you can click on the directory. There's also a video on that homepage where you can uh, learn more about the program. And then that brings up the Google map where, as I stated before, you can search by the name of the ambassador, um, the state or the state. And we actually do have ambassadors in other countries as well. So there are um, over a thousand ambassadors. So hopefully there is one near you, but you can click on the, uh, their little um, pin. And once you do that, you see their bio. So you learn about this person. Um, you also see past events that they've done. Um, and you've seen how long they've been a member. And it's really nice because there's a picture here of the ambassador. So when you meet, meet them for the first time, um, you'll know um, approximately what they look like. So that's the Solar System Ambassador Program. And we actually have an info line on here too. If you have any questions um, and, you, and you, get a, you have a hard time reaching an ambassador, you can contact us at ambassad at jpl.nasa.gov. But we're, we're very excited to partner with libraries. They're such a valuable community resource and ambassadors also love to partner with, uh, with libraries. So thank you so much for uh, watching this video and for taking the time to reach out to your local resources. And we hope that you can learn a lot about space science through our ambassadors and the Night Sky Network. Thank you so much, everyone. Great, thank you so much, Heather and Vivian for joining us. No, I'm just kidding, they're not live. Um, <laughs> So I, uh, those are the two websites. We could take a minute to go and uh, navigate through, but it is really simple um, to utilize. So I trust that you all, if you could log on to Zoom for this webinar, you can navigate those two websites. Um, but they are great um, resources for you all to, to reach out to. And I'll just say they, um, being you know NASA funded, they are not um, in the business of making money by any means. Um, normally they might if they come out and they travel far away, um, you might be very kind and offer them like a gas stipend or something like that or some chocolate bars or something like that. I think it's all about kind of building that relationship exactly. with them though. Um, they love coming out to libraries and, and teaching the public, mm -hmm. but I think, you know, you really got to put in some effort to, um, to make them feel appreciated. Exactly, it's just thank, thank your volunteers kind of mindset, just show your appreciation and uh, support in the way that you can and just find a way to make it work. And also just on that same line, if you are if you reach out through one of these um, channels and you find someone and you're putting it, you, you know, put in an email and maybe you don't hear back at first, just kind of, you know, step back and think, ah, this is a volunteer, you know, maybe I can call or maybe I can write again and just do a gentle follow-up. It's just that kind of build that relationship and see um, what makes sense for everybody in terms of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I see uh, Mark Brown, you put in, I'm not sure, you might even be a solar system ambassador. I'm not totally sure. Uh, you put in a link. So if you want to um, uh, put that to all panelists and attendees so everybody could see that. All right. That'd be fabulous. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. There's that weird square over there. Okay, so uh, Kelly, I'm just going to talk right. for a minute about um, uh, a fun activity or just yeah, some resource, resource set for you. Go. Yeah. And I'm uh, hopefully your your if your um, Wi-Fi is going to catch up here, we're having a little lag on our end, so hopefully it's not not influencing you. Um, right now, you should be seeing a little um, um, 
animated um, image of Jupiter and four of its moons. And I just wanted to have this kind of playing in the background. Um, and I'd like to invite those of you who have hosted a night sky viewing event, if you could please just jump in the chat, let us know, you know, what, what you did um, in terms of your setup. You know, did you have some telescopes out in the parking lot and maybe some activities inside or how did you, how did you make it work for you? And just to give you all a sense of, from my perspective, um, I did um, night sky viewing events as part of the Denver Museum of Nature and Science for about nine years. And I really wanted to advocate that I, I completely understand that it might be um, um, outside of normal operating hours. And there are some other things that you need to take into consideration to do an event like this. But hands down, it is by far one of the most impactful things that you can do as far as bringing science and discoveries to your location. And just to give you a sense of what that might feel like, uh, this is, again, as I mentioned, Jupiter with four of its moons. And most people probably don't think about that you can see moons around other worlds. So this has always been a, a real crowd pleaser. Um, it is bright enough to be seen even from the center of Denver. So wherever you are, if you've got Jupiter up in your night sky, highly recommend that you at least look at it through binoculars, if not through a telescope. And fun thing, you can watch four of its largest moons orbit around that planet and um, have the same experience that Galileo did when he first looked at Jupiter and had such an amazing aha moment, realizing that, wait a second, there's moons going around Jupiter. So therefore, <laughs> Earth is not at the center of the universe big deal, big discovery. So you too can have that same kind of aha moment. To give you all, we're going to try and just try the next slide. Oh, there's the, finally the GIF is showing. <laughs> GIF, GIF, we're, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. We're not sure which one it is. I'm going to go with the animated image. Yeah. <laughs> So I wanted to just bring up a, a couple of tips from uh, this idea of hosting a night sky viewing event where you might look at Jupiter or the moon is, of course, really easy to look at. And in that, you're going to want to maybe think about some tips uh, for um, you know, what, what are some do's and don'ts? So uh, thankfully, um, my colleague at the Lunar and Planetary in Institute and I have um, compiled a list of do's and don'ts from our combined experience doing this kind of an event where it's things like remember to turn off the sprinklers. Really, this is a good thing. <laughs> and other sort of tips of the trade, um, other things like, you know, it, make sure to have some stools around so that um, the smaller persons that show up can climb up and be able to look into the eyepieces. So just some tips and tricks, real easy to follow. And um, all of this is through our STEM activity clearinghouse and you are able to um, take a look in that same document. Um, there's gonna be those tips on do's and don'ts and there's also the, um, in there in that activity guide um, it is a, just kind of steps by step how you might go about facilitating this. Um, this was written all from that idea of that you're taking advantage of that night sky network or solar system ambassadors as partners to help you um, contribute um, telescopes and expertise. And maybe you're there as a facilitator, trying to engage people, helping them to just talk about their experiences. And you do that with just some simple questions that are really broad and open-ended. So people are just saying what they're observing. What color was it? How many objects were you? did you see when you looked through the telescope? And how were they arranged? Um, and you might even have people stay throughout the event and you can ask questions like, how have the planets moved? Or how have those moons of Jupiter moved? So just great ideas for you to be able to help people think about that experience and remember it. It's one of those things, if you haven't done it before, there's so many lessons to learn that yes. um, it's great to have a resource that, you know, from people that have done it before that have had mess ups that have had failures and, and things like that. Um, so, yeah. Awesome. And I'm just going to check the chat box real quick, see if there's anything. Oh, wow. Oh, there's been a lot of conversations. About awesome. Oh, thank you. Ideas. Thank you very much for wow. pitching in. Great. And um, we can make the chat transcript available as well. You can download it through Zoom afterwards. So I know I'll go back through and read all these and I imagine a lot of you folks oh. will too red light flashlight so you don't ruin your vision. Oh yeah, that is Good. a great tip. Is that in the planet for me? Sure is. Oh, nice. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm just going to stop sharing for one moment and um, gonna go back to our PowerPoint slideshow there. Perfect. Okay. 
So I'm going to talk now about, uh, let's see, we've got the people you can work with, yep. Night Sky Network Solar System, Amb Solar System Ambassadors. We have tips and tricks and mm -hmm. things to look out for, like turning off your sprinklers. Either turn off your sprinklers or bring a raincoat. Um, <laughs> <Both> and <are> <laughs> we talked a little bit about some activities you can do beforehand. We're going to talk now about an activity that you could do afterwards. You could do it beforehand. Um, I guess you could maybe do it in lieu of your night sky doing if you had weather problems. But I think this would be better to set you up beforehand or to set you up um, to reflect on the night sky viewing afterwards. So this activity is called Sky Heroes. It is, again, very easy, very low cost. Um, you really don't need to be a STEM expert to facilitate mm -hmm. this. Um, it's great for anybody. In fact, a lot of these activities are really meant to be conversation starters mm -hmm. so that you can be talking with people and having their expertise and their knowledge come out into the picture. So it's not so much a memorize this, but what do you know? Mm -hmm. I really like constellations really lend themselves to a lot of different avenues within just Absolutely. STEM and, and literacy and art and everything. Mm -hmm. um, so Sky Heroes, easy and fun to facilitate. There is a strong story time tie into this. And we have tons of recommendations on our STEM activity clearinghouse for different books um, that you could use, different constellation books. Um, something, you know, we always talk about, we always have those Greco-Roman um, constellations in our mind, but there are so many other constellations from um, indigenous people and um, other cultures across the world. So there are a lot of opportunities to explore other types of constellations. Was it in New Zealand or were they, were they not looking at the stars, they're looking at the, the blank space or the black space between the stars for their constellations? In, uh, in Australia, the, the first peoples of Australia, at least at least one of the groups, I'm not sure how many, uh, look at the Milky Way. And instead of looking at the patterns of the stars, look at the pattern of the, bl the black space that's between the stars. So nice way to capture, kind of flip it around yeah. and, and look at things a different way. Very cool. So um, Sky Heroes, you know, I have the link there, but I think it's just easy to explain it to you all. Um, the idea behind this activity is that you are giving your, your patrons, probably younger younger patrons, uh, the chance to come up with their own constellation based on one of their personal heroes, okay? Um, so that could be a family member, it could be a athlete or a movie star or a scientist or, um, yeah, let's just actually, let me try that again. It could be a scientist and we'll just leave it at that. Um, because I think scientists should be famous and more famous than other people. Um, anyway, I'll get off my soapbox. So uh, you give them blank star maps based on um, what time of year it is. So, you know, our night sky is going to look different depending on what season it is. And I'll go ahead and pull up that view while you yeah, discuss that. Sounds great. Um, and so once they come up with their hero, you know, allow them to think about it, even if they want to share with, uh, with the rest of, of the group or whoever they're with, um, let them talk about their hero a little bit and then have them draw a constellation based on their hero. So it could be a picture of that person. It could be um, uh, a symbol that uh, symbolizes that person. So there's a lot of different options here. Um, so I'll actually go ahead and jump on over. And I'll just show you what these um, what this kind of looks like. So we have a lot of different maps here. Oh. Thank you. You can see this one is for winter time. Okay. Um, now we had, there's an, I think I believe an autumn, a summer and a spring as well, of course. So I'm just going to go ahead. I have my, my hero picked out. Let's see, are we on the right angle here? And let's see. And Kelly and you can, I didn't tell them what my hero is. So you guys can um, guess. So it's basically as, Glorified game of connect the dots. <laughs> Maybe. Is Curtis your hero? <laughs> yeah, so I have made a dog bone. My hero, um, oh gosh, if my mom saw this, she would kill me. Now, uh, my, my hero is my 11-year-old uh, uh, puppy named Curtis, uh, just an inspiration in every aspect of my life. I'm being slightly sarcastic here. Um, but that is an example. Instead of drawing a dog, I drew a dog bone, right? So that's my constellation. Um, a very poorly drawn dog bone, but that's okay. So um, that's my hero. But we also have, I've asked Kelly and, and Stephanie. Fatty Wrench. Fatty Wrench. Yeah, or just a bad, bad wrench. 
or like a two-headed <laughs> dinosaur or something. I don't know. There's a lot of things you can interpret out of that. There's a lot of constellations that require imagination. This is good. Yeah, this is, we're learning in practice <laughs> here. Could have been Rocky the Flying Squirrel. <laughs> yeah, so maybe you could have your patrons draw their constellations first and then have people guess and then let them tell their story. Um, awesome. So I have some other ones here that, uh, Stephanie, this is yours, right? Let me make sure yeah. I've got it. The right, is that the right yeah, one? Yeah, that's the right one. Okay. Um, can anybody in the chat box, does anybody know what that is? Yes. <laughs> it's so terrible. I will go ahead and tell them. Do you want to, who's your an hero, elf Stephanie? Waving. That's like an elf <laughs> waving. It's supposed to be Spock. Spock, yes. Captain Kathy. 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 Awesome. It is Spock. That is Stephanie's hero. It's like you can see what kind of people we hire here. I, I challenge all of the art critics on the on the webinar with us today to try this activity and show mm -hmm. us what you got. Oh yeah. Okay, this is Claire's. Now this one's really, this is good. This is a good symbol. I don't think anybody's gonna guess what it is. So do you wanna tell everybody, Claire? Yeah, so this is a personal hero of mine, my father. I saw a face in the night sky with a mustache. So that's the mustache there. And my dad has never not had a mustache, probably since he was born. No, I don't know. But yeah, that's my dad. Zelda. So Paul is a Zelda. Oh. oh, nice. Yeah. And then, yeah, so I see people, if you are having trouble um, seeing anything, you should be able to uh, click in the top right. Uh, there's a speaker view. There's a few other options for your view in the top right. Um, and then you can drag the video screen over as well when you change those views. So feel free. You won't mess anything. Um, you can just drag the double line over, go up to the top right, toggle out of speaker view. Um, you won't mess anything for anybody else. So feel free to, to mess around. And then lastly, we have Kellyans right here. And I'm, I am honoring a scientist. This is Marie Curie. Yes. That one's... Just inspired because I learned about her during a library program. So thank you, libraries. Cosmic huh. banana. Cosmic banana. <laughs> I won't tell Marie. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> All right. So those are our winner Sky Hero charts. We would encourage you to make your own. Um, let's see. Kelsey says I would draw a donut. Kelsey, you're my hero now for <laughs> if you would draw a donut. So, <laughs> all right, I'm gonna mute this guy. All right, and Kelly, yeah, if you wanna. Whew, okay, so moving on, I just wanna talk talk really quickly about some extensions you can make to this activity. Um, there's a fun activity that we highlighted in a previous webinar, our engineer make and take craft webinar called Star Power. Um, and it's a simplified way to make a constellation projection, if you will. You use a, a tissue box or a cereal box. Um, you invert a, a series of holes with constellations. Um, and then you can shine uh, a single bulb LED flashlight through mm -hmm. and you can get your constellation. So it's, it, it's like a hack on what you were mentioning, Luna, with the, the you've got a commercial version, it sounds like, and this is the very cheap version. <laughs> very cheap, yeah. Um, and so usually you would do an active or a constellation that you already know, but that would be a fun opportunity to, you could do your own Sky Hero constellation. Um, so in the activity write up, it says to do a real life hero. Um, and I think there is definitely some merit to that, but if you wanted to expand it, you could do a fictional hero like, you know, Spock or uh, Zelda or, or whatever. Um, so there's a lot of chances there. And then lastly, um, just to kind of give patrons a full experience of constellations in the night sky, let them um, experiment with the night sky, like a simulator, like a website mm -hmm. um, or an augmented reality app. Uh, a couple of ones that we like to use Skywalker. Um, I use Google Sky because it's easy and it's yeah. browser based, um, but there are other ones out there. There's many and definitely check out the clearinghouse because we also have links lists there. Yeah, lots of recommendations. All right, so my question now for you, thinking about the moon, easy target to look at. Um, if it's a full moon, please please don't point a telescope at it. It's kind of painful actually to look through the, at the moon um, when it's full uh, through a telescope. But if you're just looking naked eye, or if you're thinking about just having a picture and letting people look at it, this is a way to invite a conversation. So I'd love to hear from you all. What do you see in the moon? And I didn't see anything in the moon before I started running this as an activity. And now I have a picture from an eight-year-old boy in my head. And I always see that. I see his picture now. So I'm not going to see what it was uh, is as you all jump in there and contribute. What do you see in the moon? I'm going to pull up our chat box. It might make a little 
thing on the screen real quick. Somebody agrees with me. I always see a rabbit. A rabbit. Oh, That's a okay. very that is a that is a common uh, story that it, there is a there are stories to go with the idea of the rabbit. Uh, this activity also has a link to a Hawaiian story called Hina Moves to the Moon, which was contributed by a scientist. And so we'd love for you to 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 highlight whatever makes sense to you and um, bring those stories in and awesome. those cultural connections. Somebody and just once again, I'll say it a billion times. But remember to do all panelists and attendees when you're sharing your answer. But somebody said a hatching dinosaur. And I don't know Absolutely. if that's in reference to the moon or the constellations we just drew, but Yoshi, Lobster, Crazy Rabbit. Oh, man. Very cool. Very fun. Yeah. Strawberry milkshake viewed from the top. Some hey, well, I think that might be a little bit with the tint on this particular photo, but. Yeah. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> I think it might be vanilla on some other nights. <laughs> All right, so uh, why don't we move on and uh, I'm gonna give you a perspective from NASA on what they see in the moon. And again, this video is available online. You may use it again. It won't go anywhere if it doesn't come through for you, but let's play it and see, yeah. see if it works. From year to year, the moon never seems to change. Craters and other formations appear to be permanent now, but the moon didn't always look like this. Thanks to NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter, we now have a better look at some of the moon's history. The moon likely started its life as a giant ball of magma formed from the remains of an impact on Earth about four and a half billion years ago. After the hot material collected into a sphere, the magma began to cool, eventually forming a crust on the surface of the moon with the magma just underneath. Around 4.3 billion years ago, a giant impact battered the moon's south pole, forming the South Pole Aitken Basin and sending debris as far as the opposite side of the moon. This impact marked the beginning of a period that would cause large-scale changes to the moon's surface. One by one, more huge collisions shaped the terrain some forming large basins that would eventually fill in to become the dark-colored patches of the moon, known as Maria. They began as normal craters, but soon started to change due to the size of the impact on the relatively thin crust. Because the moon had not yet fully cooled on the inside, lava began to seep out through the cracks caused by the impacts. The resulting volcanic activity spread lava throughout the craters, gradually filling them in and cooling. Because of the high iron content of the basalt in the rock, the maria reflect less light and therefore appear darker than the surrounding highlands of the moon. Around one billion years ago, volcanic activity ended on the near side of the moon as the last of the large impacts made their mark on the surface. The moon continued to be battered by other impactors, although they were much smaller than the objects that formed the largest basins. Some of the largest, most recent, and best known impacts from this period include the Tycho, Copernicus, and Aristarchus craters, which are unique due to the complex system of rays that stretch out from the impact site. Finally, we arrive at the moon that we see today. Though the surface continues to be affected by impacts, the rate has slowed down drastically to the point where the moon appears unchanging to the human eye, as a permanent record of its own history, and a glimpse of how craters may have formed here on Earth. So from this, you may of course use this uh, NASA animation and, and display that publicly. It is, it is available for use and, and in fact encouraged that you use it uh, to get that perspective out. And I don't know about you, but I find that fascinating that our moon has such um, a, an amazing and complicated uh, life history. It, there are sister out there in space having gone through all of that um, bombardment and um, cool moon volcanoes, who knew? So it, this is an opportunity for everyone to look at that face of the moon. You can just print out this page if you'd like. Of course, you could also print out a NASA image of the moon and just do some grayscale if you'd like. Um, but this version is from a comic book and it features a NASA scientist named Bill Bakke. And he was kind enough to have him 
himself and his team depicted by an artist uh, for this comic book. This is a page that you may use if you'd like um, uh, to get people sitting down with maybe some markers and crayons and just tracing out whether they see that rabbit or there's uh, stories about frogs in the moon, of course, the idea of a man in the moon, and lots and lots of ideas and creative thinking can go into this. Um, you may also, of course, want to connect to a little bit of the NASA scientists or have examples of the kinds of rocks that you see here. Um, they mentioned those volcanoes, uh, the, the basalt, and that's a, a rock that you can order and have um, a piece of it to have people handle. There's also a way to order a piece of rock that's uh, that wider color called a norsesite and have people um, that, that offer that for people to look at and investigate. So lots of cool connections and adaptations. Very cool. And I also wanted to highlight there's also in that clearinghouse entry for this activity, many other resources to help you um, explore the moon. We're running short on time. So why don't we go ahead and go to the next that sounds um, great. piece. Oh, quick shout out. This is the dark side of the moon, which I hope everyone will start to use the term far side instead, because clearly <laughs> it's not so dark. <laughs> it is not, no. Um, Awesome. Well, yeah, we have one last activity. I know we're kind of running short on time. So um, luckily, this is very short and easy. And I'm just going to pull it up and screen share it with you. It's called Constellation Detectives. And this is something that you could have at your reference desk, um, something that you could send home from a program, um, something that would be really good for younger patrons. Although I tried to go through and do some of these, and it was it was actually surprisingly they, difficult. They, uh, and uh, we, I've tried this activity several times with different groups. And it, it is sometimes a bit challenging, but I think in a good way. Yeah, I think so. And it's a useful, yeah, use, useful practice. So let me um, pull this up, and I'll go ahead and let's see. Screen share my. That sounds good. And while you're doing that, Brooks, just yeah. to give you all a sense, we're we're trying to give you a set of resources that if you're again feeling like you don't know all of the the um, resources for uh, how you do constellations that you might um, be able to help your patrons be able to learn more on their own or kind of do it together. It's a way for you to not have to be the expert in the mm -hmm. room, but just guiding them into discovering more of what they would like Absolutely. to know. Absolutely, yep. And I just wanna show you guys real quick through the clearinghouse. This is clearinghouse.starnetlibraries.org. To find good uh, space science activities for the summer, go to Universe of Stories, this collection down here. And from here, it has about 89, 82, it looks like activities that are specifically designed um, for uh, universe of stories or specifically picked out for universe of stories i should say we held ourselves back and we still really have did. 80 so if you need more don't worry <laughs> yeah let us know. <laughs> um, so when you click into an activity you get a lot of information related links um, information about the activity i don't have time to go into it there's a whole another webinar about accessing the clearhouse but it is a great resource all right so constellation detectives here is the write-up honestly it is a finding and marking kind of activity um, so if I'll just rotate this and we'll go down to these star maps. So first you would look at this, you would try to find Orion. Mm -hmm. um, and again, yeah, it's pretty hard. I know where it is now, but I did not earlier. I was trying mm -hmm. to connect these guys. This is, oh, this is a good, oh, Stephanie found it. Yay, ding, ding, ding. I hope others are finding it too on, on, the, on the line here. But the uh, uh, Orion is a winter constellation. So that one would be perfect for you to take out. February is a great time to go out and look at Orion. But some of these others are better for summer. So mm -hmm. you might have to be a little patient. Hopefully uh, the suspense will be good. <laughs> the big zipper. I think I know where that one is. And I was incorrect there. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that might come up for you, too, as you're working with uh, your patrons on this is people might be thinking, oh, the North Star, I've heard of that one. So that one must be very bright. And they'll be looking for that in that constellation field. And it's actually not a particularly bright star. It just happens to be aligned with the North Pole. Mm -hmm. And then the Big Dipper is that handy, of course, soup ladle one that's um, uh, that goes around, appears to go around uh, the North Star in our night sky. So real quick and easy, I would just say, if you're handing these out, make sure you have like a silver pin or something like yeah. that, you know. Um, or chalk or, or chalk orange would be, crayon, chalk would be yellow too. crayons, that, yeah. Or you could laminate it, mm -hmm. do like some dry erase markers, have people come up in circle, yeah. wipe it off. Yeah, good hack. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to stop sharing. It's just us now. We have um, 
not a ton of time for questions, but we'll be happy to, to stick around and answer anything. Greg, before everybody starts, uh, as folks might have to sign off, can you put in the Survey Monkey link and the Certificate of Attendance link? You will be directed whenever we close out, it'll send you to a post-webinar survey. And on the last page of that survey, you can access the Certificate of Attendance. Um, I know that some of you might have to jump off right now, so we'll go ahead and put those links in the chat box. Um, so I know we've asked a lot of questions, and if you guys have any questions, either put them in the chat box or the Q&A function um, is really helpful too. It just helps us organize them. So I see Susan Rolf. Oh, hey, Susan. Um, any ideas for fun things to find in a lower power telescope? Yeah. And I love that you brought that up, Susan, because many people thinking about telescopes are thinking, oh, power, I want the most, most power possible. And it's actually much easier to use a low power telescope. They're much easier to navigate and get focused and get the view on what you, you need to look at. And of course, we are on a planet that is spinning in space. So therefore, you will be looking at something and in, its, in the field of the telescope, it will shift and you'll have to keep readjusting it much easier in a lower power telescope. The moon is fabulous. Um, pick a night when it's um, either a crescent or like half lit, which is the first quarter. Um, you can also look at things like um, Jupiter. You can see all four moons, even with but just binoculars and um, things like, um, uh, if you go out right now and wanna get a, start practicing, look at Orion um, in the sword of Orion. There's a very fuzzy spot that's actually a, a nebula, a stellar nursery where stars are being born. So take a look outside with it. There's lots of fabulous things to look at um, and um, good resources online as well if you'd like to look at the clearinghouse for some expert advice. Yeah. Um, I want to answer somebody, I think earlier I missed it, they said, uh, hey, we're, we're up in Canada. Um, how does this apply to us? And mm. I think, uh, was it solar system ambassadors that they said they did have people in other countries. Yes. I will say, you know, since we're funded by NASA, um, we are specifically reaching United States citizens, but I'm sure there are a ton of great NASA resources that you can access. Um, not everything would be applicable for you in Canada, but um, there's still great online resources and, and yes. some avenues that you can take there. And, uh, amateur astronomers tend to be in many, many different communities because there are people who love looking at the night sky and invest their own personal funds in telescopes and binoculars. So look online, do a little Googling and you might might find a great partner. That yeah, way. check out the Aurora if you're close enough. Um, very important, we need to address this. How do you watch the sun? Is it not bad for your eyes? Oh, yes, do not look at the sun ever with your naked eye. Or with the tele, please or not with ever with the no, never, never. Yeah. Um, we we um, as uh, was in that video. There are there is special equipment that you can use to look at the sun, and it, those there's filters. Um, there's a lot of conversation about this on the eclipse. So if you'd like to look back at our webinar archive, we've got we go into a lot more detail. But partnering with an amateur astronomy club will also connect you in with people who can say yes, I am prepared, I have the equipment that's safe to use for the sun, or no, I don't. Um, and either way you go, you can work it out. Um, there are definitely ways to look at the sun safely, but please be cautious and yeah, do your I homework. Like, I like what Kelsey says here. I do not recommend doing it with the public in, until you absolutely know what you're doing. It is, I mean, there's risk involved um, with solar it, observations. So looking at the sun, yeah, yeah, definitely. But it can be very rewarding at the same yeah, time. Yeah, the first time I used yeah. my eclipse glasses and we got our eclipse glasses and um, I'm like, oh, we can only use them for the eclipse. But no, we just went out and I yep. used them to look at the sun and see sunspots. Um, just got to make sure they're on your face before you before you look up. But, yes. Yeah. Um, let's see. Maybe let's see, Stephanie and Claire, is there any point that came up that we should go back and address back in the in the and we, we Brooks and I have been just trying to make sure we we uh, connect in with your chat now and no you guys were hitting everything kind of in any type of the big questions i raised none so all right all right, all right. <laughs> all right. <laughs> <laughs> hanging <laughs> Uh, the survey monkey be sent out later in an email. It has been um, put in the chat box. There's a link. Look so Kelsey, if that. you scroll back up in uh -huh. that chat archive there, and you should be able to find that link to the survey monkey. Yeah. We would love to hear from you. Thank you for asking, and thank you in advance for filling out that survey to help us make yeah. these webinars better for you. Greg, I just saw you say something that it wasn't. Uh, it should be working for everybody. Let me go ahead and put it in the. Oh, thanks. You beat me to it. Having an issue with the survey link, is it closed? No, it should be good. I just pulled it up. So um, if it isn't working, I'd be happy to 
to send it out to everybody afterwards. Um, if you do have questions, my email is bmitchell. I'm just going to put it in the chat box. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, this will be available in eh, probably a day or two. We'll get it uploaded onto our YouTube channel. Um, we'll actually we'll also put the Zoom link if you want the more interactive experience where you can see the chat box and everything like that. Maybe we'll splice up some of these clips so yeah, you can just watch a quick little video instead of watching the whole webinar. Um, our next, I can't believe I didn't mention it, but our next webinar is March 7th. It is on your link bank. I think it's March 7th or March 6th. Um, it's all about solar system scale activities. Uh, so we'll just be talking about how, you know, that's a great, easy, accessible way to get people interested in uh, space science for them to um, just learn how far is it between the Earth and the Moon? How far is it between Earth and Sun? How far is Sun and Pluto? Um, and there's a lot of really cool activities you can do. March 7th, thank you, Doug. I think Doug signed up. Way to go, Doug. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and Luna, if you want to just email me, I can get you that certificate. I still uh, have a copy of that as well. I think that's about it. Um, thanks, everybody, yeah. for joining us. It was great to talk with you, and thanks for contributing your ideas. Usually by this point, we have glitter and tape and construction yeah. paper everywhere. Well, but what's wrong with us? Pretty simple. Next time. <laughs> All right, bye, everybody.